This is the first lecture of the Student Association of Foreign Affairs uh, at Bishop University in the new semester, so very, very welcome. We are very pleased to host the Ambassador of the Republic of India to Sweden as our first lecture of the semester. So please show applause warmly for Mrs. Banashri Bosetaisi. becoming a diplomat for four years, I was a lecturer. <laughs> and when I see students, young people sitting in front of me, I get this great urge to talk to them for hours. <laughs> so be warned, and um, I'm going to try and make sure that I don't exceed the limit that has been set for me of uh, 30 minutes because I would in fact try and make it even shorter if possible. But I feel that what is of real value is not for you to, you know, listen to what I have to say and the, you know, what I have to show to you, but for us to possibly interact. And I would like to hear from you what your perceptions are about India, I see that many of you are Swedish, I think, and young Swedish people. Whether you have any ideas in your mind after what we, you know, after we've, we've talked, as to whether the India-Sweden relations are headed in the right way, or if there is any new opportunity that we, the older generation, cannot see, and that you may be able to see. Uh, you may have heard the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think even more than a picture is a little movie. Now, this is a commercial, tourism commercial. But I think my idea is not to sort of promote India as a tourism destination. But what you see there, even though it has been made for a film, is really something which will, in my view, show you the diversity that India has to offer, which is at times a challenge, but we like to always see it as an asset. So. I'm 
country is this computer from? Japan. <laughs> 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 no Japanese students here, I hope. <laughs> no? Maybe you can just uh, take the baby to uh, Please, uh, while he's trying to fix it, uh, the relationship really started more on business front than anything else when in 1903 Ericsson helped India establish the first telephone exchange and got Indians talking to each other. That's right, that's what this should be. So, um, as you can see, at this time when I did this first slide, I hadn't done enough research, otherwise I would have said 17th century and I would have talked about the uh, Swedish East India Company also. Uh, but Swedish companies entered India in the 19th century and they came ahead of the intergovernmental relations for the simple reason that India did not exist as an independent country till 1947. But as soon as we became independent, Sweden was among the countries we welcomed up, which was among the first countries to establish diplomatic relations, send us an ambassador, and we of course also uh, reciprocated. And we have had, this is the boring part, we've had what in bureaucracies, what in foreign language, when you're dealing with international affairs, so you better get used to it. We always use exchange of high level visit and the term high level you don't use for when you go to India they won't say there has been a high level visit to India <laughs> you use the term high level visit to India particularly in the context of where there is a head of state that is in your case the king in our case the president or the head of government that is the prime ministers they visit each other that's called the high level and then you have the ministerial visits also and though a high level visit in itself doesn't really mean that two countries start having excellent relations. But what it does mean is that it gives a visibility to the relationship and it gets people like us working and saying, okay, what has happened? What more can happen? So it gives what we can call a stimulus to the relationship. So we actually have had, from the very beginning, very frequent uh, high-level exchanges, Companies have begun to move in both directions, and I thought you might be just interested in seeing some old and new photographs. This is our, anybody knows who that is, the gentleman in the white cap? The Indian? Who? Jawaharlal Nehru, our first Prime Minister, and one of the, I think I can objectively say, one of the most visionary statesmen that the world has seen. And with him is your Prime Minister uh, for, uh, for a very long time, Prime Minister Ananda, as you can see. Oh, that was, I didn't realize that the slide had the name. Sorry, but it cancelled. Um, this is interesting. This is our Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi. India was among the first countries to have a lady Prime Minister. And this, she has come here to attend. Did you know that your country, which takes, when I say your, I'm, I mean, addressing particularly the Swedish students, who I think are the majority here, I would say, yeah, okay. But uh, sort of everybody has just taken for granted that I'm addressing them as well. But Sweden, as you perhaps know, has had a long, or no, because you, you, you're probably born in a generation and you take it for granted. But Sweden has a very strong tradition of environmental responsibility. Among the first countries, which started to think of what is sustainable in this world. And it was in Sweden that the first conference of environment was organized uh, in, um, it, was, it was 40 years last year, so just do the maths. And our prime minister came here, and she said something which is very often even now used by people from the developing countries. She said, poverty is, the worst polluter in the world. And can you reflect on that? Can you think why she would have said that? And was it true? Anybody? Why do you think she said poverty is the worst polluter in the world? <laughs> Somebody, can you guess? Madam. Do you think it was 
was right in any in any way? Was it the right thing to say? Well, I guess if you're poor, you probably there's no way you can prioritize anything else but doing anything you can do to earn something and be <coughs> exactly. the dirtiest job, uh, trying to get as exactly. much results as possible. Absolutely. You see, when environmental responsibility means that as many Swedes do, you don't use, or in fact you don't even buy a huge, big, uh, multi-utility vehicle, but you use a cycle, <coughs> you use a, or you walk. That's environmental responsibility in the context of the developed countries. What does it mean in the context of a developing country? If environmental <coughs> responsibility means that 4 million, 400 million people cannot switch on a light, you can't expect them to say that for sake of environmental responsibility, I will agree to stay without electricity for the rest of my life. No. So you have to balance these needs of development and sustainability. And she had the vision to say this 40 years ago. You can guess who these are again. Your king and the queen in front of, I think, the world's only <coughs> monument to married love. Taj Mahal. Again, the, the king led a technology mission there, and this is the princess, crown princess in India. She was a great hit. She won the heart of every Indian that she met. This is more recent. We've come off time. Now, important bilateral agreements have been signed. Political exchanges have taken place. What does that mean in terms of relationship between two countries? Is anybody studying international relations in this uh, <laughs> yeah, full of politics, international politics. Basically, when you say there are good relations between two countries, sometimes it can mean that the people of the two countries are connected in some ways, as is the case with Britain and India, with many of the older generation in Britain still having fond memories of the time that they were in India or whatever. But in the case of most of the countries which are separated by distance, it means that, as I said, you have these high level exchanges. And you put agreements in place because between two countries, between two governments, you can't do things casually. You, know, you can't say, well, you know, let's do this, let's do that. You have to have intergovernmental agreements. And we have an agreement covering practically every area. The most recent one I'll apply is the social security agreement, which means that people can work in each other's countries. And the contribution that they make to the social security system of that country, if they leave that country to go back to their parent country, they can take that back. Otherwise, what used to happen is, let's say an Indian comes where he works and he contributes to your social security system. When he goes back to India, all the money that he's contributed just stays prettily in the Swedish coffers, and he doesn't get the benefit of having made this contribution. So this is very good for professionals when they begin to travel between two countries. It's very good if there is a social security agreement. Today, it is the mutual economic interests which have become the driver of bilateral relations between most countries. If they have a common democratic tradition, you will see leaders and ambassadors talk about the fact that these two countries are joined by their common shared values. But so what? You are a democracy, we are a democracy. You cherish your democracy. I don't think a Swede could ever imagine living in a condition other than being a democracy where you can say what you feel, where you can you know, do what you feel pretty much. Is the same in India. This is the one thing in which we are common. But what does it really mean when it comes to a relationship between two countries? It simply means that there is a degree of comfort in dealing with each other. But in real terms, the relationship between two countries begins to make a difference when it begins to bring economic fruits to each other. I can see you're smiling because you study business. So you know that in today's world, business ties, ladies and young men and women, is more important. Because ladies and gentlemen sound so formal. <laughs> in today's, today's time, it is In, 
in today's time, it is business which really links people. And at times between countries, the business interest can actually make you look at the politics differently. Uh, without being in any way critical of any country or uh, you know, implying anything, just as a matter of fact, we saw the relationship between America and China change a lot in... Uh, <laughs> Okay, bye. I can't make the phone go away. Yes. <laughs> yes, I can. I was trying to control the volume. I didn't. Okay. Uh, you have to have the economies connecting, and you have to have you have to have people feeling that yes, having good relations with this country means something to me. It could mean. A profit to you if you're a business, it could mean if you're a consumer, it could mean that you get something that you didn't get before, like people in India are going to get Swedish meatballs now. So, you know, this makes a makes difference. Or education, it may mean that after you've done something and you want to specialize in this, uh, this, this uh, wonderful buzzword, emerging markets, that you can go and study in India because there are better relations between the countries. This is what makes a difference. And today, I would say mainly it is common economic interests which have become the driver of the bilateral relations. Sweden has many technologies, many uh, uh, advances which could be of help to India in its process of development. And we have a great market and we have very good, high quality human resources who can work together with Swedish companies and make your products perhaps more cheaply for a larger market and maybe make even better products. And investments are increasing in both directions. Uh, Swedish investment in India, long history, I told you that your companies actually came to India even before the government did because India was not independent. And almost every Swedish company, in fact many Swedish companies which are today not perhaps 100% Swedish anymore, companies like ABB, companies like AstraZeneca, but which started off as Swedish companies, came to India and are very well established and very well respected in our markets. Growing Swedish presence in India, you can see the reasons why there are so many Swedish companies in India present today, just as there are almost every major advanced company and companies are present in India. But what you may not know is that Indian investments in Sweden have also begun to grow in the last 10 years. <coughs> and they have begun to come here and find opportunities, obviously in the IT sector, about which perhaps you people are aware that India developed a great strength in this because we uh, well, your company, Ericsson, helped us have a very good telecommunication system and we had the right trained people who took advantage of it. So we moved very fast in the IT sector, faster than we moved in other manufacturing areas. We could take advantage of this one area and Indian economy grew very rapidly as a result of this IT boom. But not only in the IT sector, even in chemicals and other areas, a few other areas, Indian investments are coming. In fact, there was a time when a big Indian automobile company was in talks with Volvo. Alas, for me, they didn't succeed in getting it. Otherwise, I would have been driving a Volvo today. <laughs> uh, new Indian establishments in Sweden, in different sectors, as you can see. Many Indian companies. Some of you may recognize the names of some of them, uh, but I don't really expect you to. But Watch this space, you will get to hear of them more. The way ahead. You remember the last part of my last three words in my presentation are supposed to be for the 21st century. Now, for the 21st century, where we already are, the thing is, as I mentioned, the areas in which India has needs, Sweden has strengths, which is what makes me very optimistic and made me use this particular image 
to show you the way ahead. Let us look at some of the areas. Environment and clean energy. I've already talked about the fact that Sweden was a leader in terms of policies of environmental responsibility. Hand in hand with that, you have also developed very good technologies and methodologies. Just this morning, in fact, my morning began very early. So if I do say something silly, you should forgive me. But it started with a visit to the waste to energy plant that you have here, and which is, I believe, an excellent example for us to follow. Uh, clean energy uh, in every way, whether it is, in, you know, India is focusing on solar energy, because that's one advantage we have over you. <laughs> but, uh, clean energy, uh, waste to energy, even energy efficiency, uh, using energy more, you know, you having an energy sensitivity even in the way you design your buildings. There are many, many areas in which we can learn. And if any of you remember the long list of agreements that I cracked at you, there was, there is an agreement for cooperation and exchanges in environment as well as in renewable energy under which the Swedish Energy Agency is doing many interesting things in India and that is definitely well, going to be one of the key areas for India-Sweden relations in the 21st century. Infrastructure. India has inherited an infrastructure from a colonial power. Therefore, most of our infrastructure was both old and not really meant for the need of a developed country. Uh, you know, everything went out to the ports to take things out. But you have to change that, and we didn't get our act together properly to begin with. And that's why we are dealing with a lot of challenges in this field. But all those challenges, you know, it's, it's a common statement in management. Every challenge means an opportunity. And in India's case, that is particularly true. And a number of major companies in the region, uh, from Malaysia and others, are coming into our investment because just think of it, once you unleash the growth potential of 1.2 billion people, the size of the market is so huge that these infrastructure facilities will be used to an extent that will make you go off the profitability chart. So companies which have the vision and have the resources, I mean, you can't expect small and medium companies to do that, but companies which have the resources and the vision and their balance sheet can take it, are all looking to India. Defense. In this city, this is something that really needs to be focused on because you are the headquarters of Saab's air uh, capabilities. And Saab actually, Saab Defense, it may not have been able to sell its Gripen to us yet. It has given us many <coughs> defense technologies and our defense requirements are unfortunately very extensive. Uh, Sweden is very lucky, actually I shouldn't say that, it's today that you are in a zone of peace and harmony. I mean, if you look 200 years back, it wasn't that harmonious, was it? It was an area where there was great conflict among all the different countries here. But today, you're a model of regional peace. We, unfortunately, in South Asia are not. So we have to cater to our defense. Any independent country of the size of India cannot depend on any other country or any other umbrella for its security. Your people will not let you. They, it is a matter of their, uh, what can I say, self-confidence. To If we felt that we had to depend on X, Y, Z, any country in the world for our defense, I don't think a government which followed a policy of that type would ever come, come to power in any case. So defense will remain a huge priority. We, because of the past political relations, have a defense portfolio in terms of equipment which is largely Soviet Union. Anybody remembers that it was a country of that name? Mm -hmm. Most of our stuff was uh, uh, sourced from Soviet Union and we are in the process of modernizing it, changing it, diversifying it. So again, a huge, huge opportunity which I think will be exploited because India and Sweden have excellent relations of trust. You do not have defense relationship with a country which you don't trust. Remember that. Education and skill formation. This is the area for the future because Sweden, you have a lot of everything. What you don't have is enough 
young people. Enough population in general, but certainly not enough young people. And that is India's strength and challenge again. 50% uh, of our population currently is under 30 years of age. And this is likely to continue. It will plateau off, but whereas in China it's already, you're already beginning to see the dipping of the curve, in case of India it's another 15 years before the young population percentage will start to decline. These young people we have to train, we have to upgrade their skills, and then they can help the world do whatever the world needs to do where there is enough. Even your universities, forget the skill, your universities will run out of students. So you really have a huge opportunity there in the 21st century for education and skill formation. And this is an area, again, I'm you know, particularly focused on in telling you at the institutional level where already there is very good cooperation in the field of Karolinska Institute, uh, Lund University, University of Gothenburg, Uppsala University, all three have a chair of India studies where an Indian professor comes for six months in an area that they choose and interact with the students. Uh, many scholarships are happening. So this, in my opinion, and I'm not saying this just because I'm in an institution of education, this I think will be a great focus area coming up in our international relations. And this I'm very, uh, very happy to inform you that beyond universities, going below university level, even at the school level, we are beginning to see young people connect. And this is the future of India-Sweden relationship. When the young people start connecting, and this is what makes me so optimistic about the future of the relationship. I'm sorry I've left you only 10 minutes for questions, but I'm ready, I'm ready to stay on a little longer than you are. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? If nobody asks a question, I'll start lecturing again. <laughs> <laughs> Any reactions? Any comments? Yes, please. What is the biggest difference between India and Sweden? Um, Okay, I think that the biggest difference between India and Sweden is probably, uh, and I hope this will change and it's going to be complementary to Sweden, but maybe I should give one on plus and the minus side both. Uh, I think in India the importance of organization, the importance of timekeeping, this is only slowly begun to be understood. Whereas in Sweden, you know, everything is so organized, you don't even see people who are rendering you a particular service. It just happens or it just takes place and it is looked after. I think this organization, which uh, uh, is something that we can learn from uh, Sweden, would really be of big help to us. On the other side, I think because of this, uh, you know, extensive organization, sometimes I see a lack of, uh, I can't say innovativeness because Swedish are also very innovative people. I see a lack of adaptability or a lack of, you know, finding a quick solution. I have personally experienced it. I talked to somebody about a particular issue and which they haven't come across before or it's a, it's a, it's a slightly outside the normal parameter, and they can't find a solution, okay? Whereas in India, you're, and this I've actually seen happen, somebody is driving a Mercedes and is adventurous and has gone into a village and the Mercedes has developed a problem. Now you won't find Mercedes parts in a small village. Somebody will find something or the other and they will make that car run to the next garage. So there is an ability to do frugal engineering. In fact, it's become recognized as one of India's strengths that you find a solution which works and which can cost maybe at times one tenth what it can cost elsewhere. Sorry, long <coughs> answer to a short question. I'll try to be briefer to you. Yes. And you just mentioned uh, this is the area that I do research, mm -hmm. the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And for long, the 
the Western the market has been saturated. And the problem was that the um, European companies could not enter into the developing countries as, for instance, India, mainly because of the cost differences. But nowadays we can see companies coming from the developing countries, like Tata Motors, mm -hmm. that are at a level of coming up with these solutions for more cheaper than the uh, <coughs> And uh, they are the ones that who can uh, uh, produce um, more efficiently and then export to other yeah. developing countries. India has in fact become the global hub of cheaper, smaller cars, not just for the Indian market, because in the Indian market, I'm afraid we are still very stages conscious. Uh, the Tata's fabulous innovation of this, you know, nano car, which costs just about under $3,000. In India, it did not become that successful because an average Indian who can afford a car wants to afford a bigger car, you know? So, uh, the, so but it has succeeded a lot in, in outside the country. But yes, that's a very, very valid point indeed. Yes? I would like to ask a question, maybe on the opposite of the first one. What are the similarities between, um, you know, between Swedish people? Similarities between the people? Yeah. Well, you the I, I will, I'll, give you my, I'll, give, I'll give you my perception, and you should tell me whether you think it's right or not. I think what is common, because obviously, I, you know, not, not many people who have hated their experience in India would come up to tell me you're, you're very polite. That's, by the way, another difference. I think uh, Swedish people are extremely polite, but so are Indian people. So maybe that is a that is a similarity. We're both very polite people. <laughs> but I think what is similar is what I said that a Swedish person will speak his or her, you know, mind. And I know it sounds conflicting that you've been polite and yet you speak your mind, but you're used to a, a, a free environment, and you speak what you feel. And you don't expect to be punished for that. Mm -hmm. Indians are exactly the same. They will speak what they what they want, um, and they will express their opinions. And uh, you know they will happily sit down and argue. You. Another thing that I discovered was in common is that uh, maybe I, I have been I think very fortunate that I have you know been able to make what I call normal Swedish friends. When I say normal, what I mean is people who are not diplomats or working in the government. Normally, if you're a diplomat, that's the kind of people you meet, you know, that comes across in your work. And with them, there is always a degree of formality. But I'm, I'm very lucky that I've, you know, met, just by chance met ordinary uh, Swedish people who have invited us to their home. And I find that when you, you invite somebody to the, your, your home, and you don't worry about is it a small home, big home, all the doors are open and the guest is you know allowed to go just anywhere. This is something you'll find in India. Uh, it happened to my husband. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a Britisher, and when he came on his first trip uh, after we we had met in England, I left him in the house and I come back and he, he's not there. And I'm getting worried, and then he you know sort of marches in after a while and he says you know I was just walking in in the neighborhood and. A guy started talking to me and he said, oh, well, you haven't seen the sights here? Come sit, you know, he, this guy had little, uh, we, have, we call them scooters, you know, two-wheeler, Vespa scooters. He said, well, sit, sit in the back. And he showed him the sights and then said, you know, come and have a, a pakora, a typical Indian snack, come and have pakoras at my home. And then he brings Gary home. So it's, you know, it's, it just happens. There, there, there is. Though I don't think this is that Swedish, by the way. I, I don't think that's the way. 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 I don't But you know, there is that no sense of barrier about my home is small or it's, uh, you know. If you are welcome to get to me, you come in and take me as I am. So I feel that is, that is something so common. It, about the differences in India, in the business sense, one big difference, and again, I hope we will learn from Sweden, is India is very hierarchy bound. You understand the word hierarchy, you know, levels. Yeah. Uh -huh. Whereas in Sweden, I find that you have, of course, the top CEO is the top CEO, but you don't have 15 levels below it. <laughs> you know, you would have maybe two levels and then a whole lot of, it's sort of, it's not a pyramid like that. It's more flat. And I think that 
For today's world, that's a much better system. Yes, please. <coughs> Another question about foreign affairs, because for being such a big country, India is staying quite low in many questions and uh, like uh, security questions or environmental issues. Do you think this will change and why has it been so the last 50 years that they're staying uh, low in comparison to other? You know, when, when India became independent, which you would be far too young to remember even, I mean I just, even I wasn't around then, but uh, uh, we, as I said, were blessed with a wonderful statesman in our Prime Minister. And there were a lot of issues in the world which again you may have, you know, you wouldn't be aware of. There were many, many countries which were still under colonial power. And India is a country which had managed to liberate itself from colonial rule with non-violence. Was a great inspiration. Even Martin Luther King, uh, whom you may have heard of, said that Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi of India was his biggest inspiration. And at that time, in fact, India in the foreign relations was playing a very important role because the issues that were in the forefront of foreign affairs were issues in which India had an experience and it could contribute. So we then and even now contribute a lot to UN peacekeeping forces. After that, the world changed, you know. And India became more focused on its own internal development, which didn't go as fast and as smoothly as our initial leaders thought. To the extent that in 1991, India was faced with a huge economic challenge and for the first time in its life as a country, faced with having the possibility of defaulting on its loan, which we have never done and even now have never done. So it came to a moment of great economic crisis. So India became more inward looking. And then the world changed. You needed to be an economic power or a military power to make, to make a point, to have a stand. And of course, United Nations Security Council is frozen in time. It remains the victors of the World War II. India was nowhere there. And once you come up with a system where it can be changed only by those who stand to benefit most from it, it will never change. But I'm happy to say that there is a growing realization that countries like India do need to have a place in those decision-making councils. And G20, for example, which is much newer. In fact, I was very fortunate to be there at the birth of G20 in Washington. And uh, I don't know whether any of you even remember, but that was President Bush, the much maligned President Bush, who came up with the idea. And India was an automatic choice. We did not have to lobby for it, <laughs> you know, as we, as we often have to lobby for many things. There was no question of lobbying. India was there. So, I wouldn't entirely agree with you that India's role is not being recognized. It is being recognized in some forums, in some forums we still have to fight. But the last thing that I would like to say in response to your question is that India really, it's going to sound as if, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give a very, you know, superior picture of India. But India doesn't really believe in playing the power game, you know. We believe that power is not something that you have to exercise. Power is manifested. So we believe more in what in, uh, in, in, in a buzzword is often called soft power, not hard power. Hard power is when you can say to somebody, we won't give you oil or we will march into your country. We believe more in working through persuasion, working through example, working through building relations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Ambassador. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. It was a very short presentation, but uh, very interesting. Uh, we would like you to have a small gift from us, hopefully you have a taste of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.